righty. So today we're doing Susan Glaspell's Trifles, and I'm going to repeat this rather rapidly, probably. I need to start my stopwatch. And, um, and I'm not going to put the text up of the play up because it's just too long and it would be too distracting to try and scroll through it as I read. So let's begin. author biography. Although her work was neglected in post-World War II America, Susan Glaspell is new, noted today as a pioneering feminist writer and an important modern playwright, with trifles often referred to as one of the greatest works in American theater. Glaspell was born in rural Iowa on July 1st, 1876, the family moving to Davenport when she was a teenager. By 18, she was earning wages as a journalist for a local newspaper. At 21, she enrolled at Drake University, though local belief held that, quote, college made women unfit for marriage. And by the way, uh, Wikipedia was my primary source for the biography. She excelled at school and began to work at the Des Moines paper the day after her graduation. There, she was a reporter covering the state legislature and murders, hardly typical fare for a woman of the time. She resigned at age 24 after covering the story of a woman convicted of killing her abusive husband. She returned to Davenport and began writing short stories and used her earnings to move to Chicago, where she wrote her first novel in 1909. It was an instant bestseller. In 1913, at the age of 37, Glaspell married George Cook, with whom she moved to New York, where the two associated with social reformers and activists, and Glaspell joined a feminist debating group. In the summer of 1915, Glaspell and Cook went to Cape Cod, where they worked with friends to form the Provincetown Playhouse, an experimental theater company. After two seasons, the players moved their theater to New York City, but Cook and Glaspell left the company because it had become, quote, too successful. In 1922, the pair moved to Greece, but Cook died in 1924, and Glaspell returned to Cape Cod. Over the course of her lifetime, Glaspell wrote over 50 short stories, nine novels, 15 plays, and a biography. The 1930 play, Allison's House, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Socio-historical context. The rise of feminism in the first decades of the 20th century, both in the U.S. and Europe, culminated in 1920, with the passing of a constitutional amendment guaranteeing women the right to vote. All right. And you get to see me without my glasses because it's the only way I can read this close. The play, um, Trifles, was a one-act play, a play set in only one location with continuously running action. According to the conventions of drama, it presents a list of characters, also known as a dramatist personae, and incorporates only stage directions, supplied parenthetically, and dialogue to tell the story. Trifles, by the way, was also presented as a short story, rewritten actually as a short story called A Jury of Her Peers. The character list is shown in order of social importance, not in the conventional order of appearance. George Henderson, county attorney, Henry Peters, Sheriff Lewis Hale, a neighboring farmer, Mrs. Peters, and Mrs. Hale. Note how the characters enter men first and in descending order of importance, with the women entering next, also in order of importance, the sheriff's wife first, and the farmer's wife last. This simple and easily overlooked element in the play helps set the stage for the power struggle that ensues. Indeed, among its potential themes, Trifles presents a strict social structure, structure and gender roles dominated by men, both in the world at large and in the home. 
the women in the play struggle against this social structure, torn between their gender, gender loyalty to Mrs. Wright, the woman presumed to have the woman presumed to have killed her husband, and in whose home the play is set, and their responsibility to their husbands and to the law. In the end, gender loyalty seems to win out as the women, unlike the men, discover that justice is more complicated than guilt. The social conflict is established in the play in two ways, with the way the male characters feel about and treat the women, and in dialogue and discoveries suggesting that the dead man, John Wright, may have been abusive. The gender loyalty elements are built through revelations of the women's shared experiences. At the beginning of the play, the authority of the men is quickly established. They rush in and go directly to the stove for warmth, though Henderson, whose dialogue is introduced by his title, suggests the ladies come up to the fire. Mrs. Peters declines only after a first step forward, indicating reluctance to intrude rather than not being cold. The men then dominate the conversation as the exposition or background is delivered by Mr. Hale, the farmer. The men then start to look for a motive in the killing for which Mrs. Wright has already been detained. Looking around, the sheriff, Mr. Peters, declares nothing here but kitchen things, a first indication of men's attitudes about the importance of women's work. When it is discovered that some jars of preserves had broken and that Mrs. Wright had been worried about them, Peters and Henderson make derogatory remarks and Hale notes, women are used to worrying over trifles, small, insignificant things, thus revealing the source of the play's title. This causes Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale to move closer to each other the first indication of their gender bond. Further criticism of Mrs. Wright's housekeeping causes Mrs. Hale to become defensive, and in a bit of foreshadowing, Henderson states, loyalty to your sex, I see. As the conversation between Henderson and Mrs. Hale continues, she notes, I don't think a place would be any cheerfuller for John Wright's being in it an indicator of the dead man's temperament. It has already been noted that he declined getting a telephone, instead preferring isolation. Mrs. Hale comes close to revealing a potential motive for the killing, but Henderson blows it off. Not treating a woman's opinion as important, instead stating, we'll return to that later, which he never does. The men then decide to search the murder scene, an upstairs bedroom, but Henderson gives the women an order to keep an eye out for anything that might be of use to us. Again, asserting his authority and ordering the women to an action. The women, left alone, begin to clean and talk about the labor of canning fruit, a shared experience of farmers' wives during the time period. Mrs. Peters, who is to claim some of Mrs. Wright's belongings and takes them back to her, asks Mrs. Hale to accompany her into the next room, another indicator of the security felt in same-gender relationships. Returning to the kitchen, Mrs. Hale provides some background about Mrs. Wright, including her maiden name, Minnie Foster, which she uses again later on in the story. During this discussion, Mrs. Peters closes the door to the upstairs, thus isolating the women from the men and maintaining the security of the female group. They then discuss Mrs. Wright's guilt and the, mur the murder and Mrs. Wright's guilt. Mrs. Hale defends Mrs. Wright, but Mrs. Peters defends the men's actions in looking for a motive, saying, the law is the law. Near the end of this conversation, they find a quilt. Mrs. Wright has been a quilt Mrs. Wright has been working on, but are interrupted when the men return to the kitchen. Mr. Peters, though, overheard the end of the conversation and makes a snide remark about the quilting process, and the other men laugh, 
the women being described in the stage directions as looking abashed. Almost immediately, the men go outside, still looking for any possible clues. As the women further examine the quilt, they find irregularities in the stitching, which Mrs. Hale unravels and begins to re as Mrs. Peters looks for paper and strings to wrap the parcel being taken back to Mrs. Wright. She says to Mrs. Mrs. Peters says to Mrs. Hale, I don't think you should do that. And in a statement a couple sentences later says, I don't think we should be touching things. Again, the shift in pronoun from you to we starting to show or showing more deeply this connection between the female characters that is forming. Oh boy. <laughs> I forgot where I was at. Um, they find okay, but are interrupted when the men return to the kitchen. Okay, uh, okay, rats. I'm sorry. I'm gonna just start here um, because I know I read this near the end of this conversation. They find a quilt. Okay, here we go. I know where I was at. Okay. Um, as Mrs. Peters looks for the paper and string, she finds instead a birdcage and asks if Mrs. Wright had a bird. Mrs. Hale doesn't know, but remembers a traveling salesman who had canaries and says that Mrs. Wright sang real pretty, connecting her with the bird symbol. They find also that the cage door was broken, a hinge pulled apart, the conversation then turns to Mrs. Hale's guilt about not visiting more often, part of which, though, she blames on John Wright, who she describes as a hard man, like a raw wind that gets to the bone. The two women decide to take the quilt to Mrs. Wright, along with her sewing things. They find a sewing basket, and in the sewing basket, a box. Wrapped in silk in the box, they find the bird, the canary, its neck broken forcibly, wrung, turned around backwards. Before they can discuss the discovery, the men return, continuing the joke about, to, to joke about the quilt and its method of finishing. Mrs. Hale hides the box, and when the men note the empty bird cage, she lies that they think the cat got the bird. It was earlier revealed by Mrs. Peters that Mrs. Wright didn't like cats, that she was superstitious about their presence. And she says of the cat that cats can be superstitious and they leave when someone dies. Mrs. Peters continues, and again, um, Mrs. Peters continues the lie when Henderson asks about the cat's presence. The men then go back upstairs, still looking for a motive. As soon as they leave, Mrs. Peters recounts a childhood story of a boy cutting off her kitten's head with a hatchet, ending it with, if they hadn't held me back, I would have. This story both helps to explain Mrs. Wright's motive for the murder and relates an experience that Mrs. P that makes Mrs. Peters sympathetic having herself felt what Mrs. Wright must have felt when her husband killed the bird. As the two continue to talk, a motive is further developed, and the method of the murder, a rope which choked the life out of him, is linked to the way the bird was killed. The conversation ends with Mrs. Peters saying jokingly that if the men could hear us, maybe they would certainly laugh. Mrs. Hale says, Maybe they would, and maybe they wouldn't. Through the conversation, though, Mrs. Hale starts to feel some shared guilt, felt that if she'd been closer to Mrs. Wright, something might have been different. She states, I might have known she needed help. I know how things can be for women, denying that this has happened to her. I can tell you it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We live close together and we live far apart. We all go through the same things, 
It's just all a different kind of same things. The statement is a gender is an explanation of the gender loyalty, the feeling the two are feeling that isn't limited to just them. When the men return, Henderson superficially examines the items Mrs. Peters has selected to take to Mr. Wright, laughing that they're not very dangerous things, and noting that a sheriff's wife is married to the law, at which the sheriff chuckles, right? Just even, even though women are, in fact, you know, bound to their husbands through through this, this social contract of marriage at the time. They think it's a joke. <laughs> As the men leave the room one more time, the women's eyes meet. Mrs. Peters tries to hide the box in her bag, but it's too big and she can't. She tries to remove the bird from the box, but again, she can't, being overcome with emotion. So Mrs. Hale takes it from her and hides it in her coat pocket. As the men, okay, the play ends with Henderson once again returning to the joke about the quilting, asking what the name of the process was, and Mrs. Hale responds, not it, K-N-O-T-I-T, -T, in a kind of final joke, this time on the men who wouldn't look for a motive in the kitchen and the trifles of women's work. Yeah. Obviously, there's a whole lot more going on in this play than I can possibly, you know, talk about in 20 minutes. There are a variety of symbols, the most noteworthy of which is the bird, um, which is linked directly to Mrs. Wright a couple of times by Mrs. Hale, uh, a quote that she also sang very prettily. Um, that she was like a bird herself. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, because it's 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 important, and I wish I'd included it in my written notes, but I didn't. Um, oh my! Okay, I'm obviously not going to be able to find it very. Oh, here it is, Mrs. Hale. She referring to. Um, Mrs. Wright, she, come to think of it, she was kind of like a bird herself, real sweet and pretty, but kind of timid and fluttery. How she did change. Yeah, so again, the, the bird, a, a symbol of freedom that was caged within this house and then removed from the cage and had its neck wrung literally killed while the symbolic linking to mrs hale kills her spirit symbolically and then of course becomes the motive for the murder there are also some other possible themes in this and and um i'm trying to think more broadly about both the relationship of the two women in the story and the relationship of mrs wright and her husband when i state and again, uh, when you're making a statement of theme you, that you want to be inclusive. Now, if I, my, my notes about this were already 1600 and some words long. And of course, to write an essay, I'd, I'd be there. But to really examine the entire play, you need something much more inclusive. And this is what I came up with. People, both as individuals and in groups who feel picked on, repressed, isolated, even abused, may grow defensive and take actions against their repressors, abusers, which may be outside the realm of what they would typically do. Those actions may even be illegal and or violent. And this is, in fact, what we see, Mrs. Wright's violent action against her husband and indirect um, denial of the order that Henderson gave the women to look out for clues. They find everything the men are looking for and refuse to give it to them, hide it from them, and remove it from the scene so that it can't be found by the men in the future. Um, interesting, interesting play, saturated with all kinds of 
of little things in, in such a way that the the play pieces together the motive much in the way that the quilt is a quilt is pieced together the quilt being another one of the primary symbols in the play so i hope you read this before um viewing this video because uh, that would add an awful lot to your experience and if you didn't read it I hope that my discussion has made you interested enough to go back and do so thank you much